Hi, and welcome to Ramdas Here and Now. I'm Raghu Marcus, again, back with you all. So we've gone back again into the archives of the Media Library. Uh, by the way, I must mention, uh, this is another great podcast, and I'm, I'm being given these podcasts by our curator, Nathan Wilburn, who's ha- who takes care of the Media Library for us here. And uh, th- he just finds one gem after another. So I'm pretty happy about that because I get to experience it like it's the first time. Not that I've heard. Uh, we have so many of these. There's no way I could have listened to these. I mean, you're talking uh, about a couple of thousand, 3,000 hours of all this stuff. I mean, we just got a whole load of it. Uh, from uh, another foundation uh, late, uh, late last year, and uh, which brings up, and so we're processing it, and that means uh, it, it's a bunch of work getting it into spreadsheets and described, and what is it, and keyworded so everybody can find uh, the good parts or the good talks from him and uh, and his friends, and just one tiny comment, if anyone is interested in helping us in any way in terms of support for the media library. That is uh, an ongoing project. It's been for two years. I would say we're about halfway through at this point, uh, maybe 60%. Please do just uh, go to ramdas.org and write to us at info or make a donation. Uh, We appreciate it. It's the backbone of everything we can offer out there. Okay. Just wanted to get that in a little bit. And this um, this talk is is from nearby where I live. It's from Greensboro, North Carolina, from 1981. And uh, what's terrific about this is Ram Dass starts out talking about, shall we say, this, that, and the other. A little bit about uh, his view of politics and uh, and power and uh, he makes some funny comments about Washington and the scene there, which uh, could exactly fit the times that we're in right now. And But at some point into the talk, he talks about how he's been uh, really uh, studying, reading the uh, Third Chinese Patriarch, uh, which to him... It was somebody with the highest teachings, and uh, it's uh, the Heart Mind Sutra. And he just read like two, a few lines from it. And you, he, it's the depth of this; uh, these verses is just uh, extraordinary, it really. Is so. Just two lines. I mean, I love them. You're going to hear them. But the great way is not difficult for those who have no preferences. That's the that's the beginning of it, and you could sit for a week with that, as as he says. Um, but the, what what's really great is this gets further as he keeps continues to talk about, it, and it's a lot around duality and uh, transcending dualism and the idea that we are absolutely uh, both living as separate and living in the one, uh, and it's very very hard to. Um, Bring those two things uh, together. Can you allow for both of them at the same time? That's the big question. So this this is really a, uh, and and the more he gets into this, uh, it it seems like it's a it's a funny combination, not funny, but great combination of uh, Ramdas in a very meditative state, but uh, uh, explicating things that are, are quite difficult, absolutely difficult. And we've talked about some of this stuff before. Uh, especially at these retreats and on some of these podcasts, and it's around free will, and yet everything is determined. How can you live with both of those uh, concepts? And that's the dualistic nature of uh, of the universe. Uh, you are, and his suggestion is that you identify with neither of them, but don't deny either of them. So you kind of know where to stand. Uh, th- it's um, really talk about food for thought and. Uh, and living that dichotomy, I think that that's uh, that's our our biggest struggle because it, if, it it's absolutely the core of everything we are and what the universe is. So beautiful meditation, everybody. Uh, this is 
Ramdas here and now. Again, thanks for your support. Please continue. Go to ramdas.org. And by the way, on ramdas.org, go look up this featured teacher, Tilopa, T I L O P A, great Tibetan master. But he grew up, he was in India and he went through a lot of really far out things. And, and you can see a video uh, talk from the 17th Karmapa. Uh, who gives a dissertation on Tilopa. So ramdas.org, we'll see you next time. I couldn't help uh, remembering when I was listening to Milton Friedman talk about uh, Washington. Um, It's interesting. I have a very different view of um, uh, politics uh, than I used to as a child. Um, I remember Maharaji once was sitting on his bed. I was just sitting with him, and in the distance there was a lot of commotion because Indira Gandhi was going through town, and she had Cadillacs, and there were jeeps with generals and tanks and the whole production. And he sort of yawned, and he said, look at all that. It's just a worldly king. Like, no big deal. It's very hard to get power into perspective. When I was 17, this is just a personal anecdote, when I was 17, my father was the president of the board and the founding father of a place called Brandeis University, and that was the first year of the university. And the board of trustees were a group of wealthy men who wanted to start a Jewish-sponsored non-sectarian university in the same way as this is a Quaker non-sectarian university. And the problem was that none of the board members had ever gone to college. And I was a freshman at Tufts. And they used to call me down to the board meetings to ask about how things worked at college. (laughs) Like they were saying, could you hire two assistant professors for the price of one full professor? (laughs) Seemed reasonable. I mean, you know, you get two Pintos for one Dodge, you know. (laughs) Uh, What's a provost, Richard? And to them, the president of the university was an employee. So when I became a professor at Harvard and I looked at the board of trustees or fellows and, and the president, I just saw them as sort of employees and just sort of as a game. I never kind of got caught in, there's the president. And I guess I have sort of the same feeling about the Washington scene. It seems a little bit like um, well-meaning pubescent boys who are power tripping with their puberty, you know? That's what it feels like. I guess I should be frightened, but I'm not. Um, Here's an interesting story. That same doctor, um, after the doctor was there and Maharaji started to pay attention to him, he said to him one day, UNO doctor, This kid had been sort of a hippie doctor in the United States, this fellow. Wavy Gravy was his patient, one of his patients. He said, um, you are no doctor, which Larry said was what his mother used to say to him all the time, you are no doctor, because he didn't make a lot of money. But it turned out that uh, Maharaji was saying, UNO, United Nations Organization, doctor. And he sent Larry to Delhi to join the UN. Larry went to Delhi and they only laughed. Here's a long-haired guy, hippie in India, doctor. They said, we don't have any space for you. And they sent him back. And he went back and it's like a nine-hour bus trip up to the mountains. Back, Maharaji says, UNO doctor, go to Delhi. So Larry goes a second time. And they laugh again. And Larry goes again and again. Now we're getting up to nine times. And Mar- Larry's patience is wearing a little thin because Maharaji is obviously too stupid to understand the bureaucracy as much as he wants to touch his feet. I mean, even Larry was having doubts. 
Finally, they said, look, would you stop bugging us? We don't have any space for a doctor. But maybe you could be an administrative assistant or something. He says, look, anything, just to get my guru off my back. <laughs> so they said, well, okay, there is only one more thing. You will need security clearance. And Larry says, well, forget it. Because I've got this history with the Doctors for Cuba program and stuff like that. So Larry goes back and he says to Maharaj, he's, look, there's not a chance. He's now gone back 11 times. He says, not a chance. I need security clearance. No way I'm going to get it. So Maharaj, he's sitting there and he pulls his blanket over his head and he says, who's in charge? And he really hams it up. I mean, he's really doing his, you know. So Larry says, his name is Henderson. He's head of the World Health thing, smallpox. And he's got to get permission from, uh, I think, the uh, Surgeon General, who can give security clearance. Maharaji says, what's his name? Henderson. Maharaji says, spell it. H-E-N. And Maharaji is really playing this soothe, you know, this boy, am I doing it? He gets all finished. He puts the thing. He says, got a deli. Larry says, again, my God, there's no chance. But you have to understand that at the moment Maharaji was saying that, there was a cocktail party going on in Zurich, at which Mr. Henderson was there as a guest of the American Embassy. And who was there but the Surgeon General? Surgeon General said to Henderson, how are things going with the smallpox eradication program? And he said, well, the Russians are giving this, the Swiss are giving this. He says, well, what about us? Are we giving things? He says, well, you know, I don't know why I got involved in this, but there's a young doctor that we were going to take on, but he can't get security clearance. And the Surgeon General says, what does he need that for? He says, it's the law. He needs it. Who gives it? You do. I do. Give me a cocktail napkin. What's his name? And he writes down, Larry Brilliant has security clearance and signs it, the Surgeon General. That's at the moment, H, E, N, see? <laughs> see, so how can you take it all too seriously? I mean, do you really figure you know what the game is? Do you really think you know who's running the show? Maharaji once said to me, you know, Lincoln was a pretty good president. Said, yeah. He says, yeah, because he knew Christ was president. He was only acting president. <laughs> That's a nice line. Jimmy almost knew that, but he sort of forgot along the way. But he sort of knew it. He sort of knows it. That's what's so irritating. He'll learn, though. Everybody learns. Even we learn. That's what we're doing here. What Emmanuel said to me was, I said, Emmanuel, what should I do? He says, look, Ramdas, he said, you're enrolled in a school, why don't you take the curriculum? <laughs> I mean, what are you trying to be so phony holy for? Why don't you be human? You're a human. Try being human. I thought of all that stuff that I sort of was too human. You've got it, I'm sure, some of it. Emmanuel says, if you want to become free, you're going to have to embrace original sin. Wow, are you sure you want to listen to this guy, Emmanuel? doesn't mean you have to do evil, but you have to allow the fact that all is what is. It's really scary. You're not going to get there on righteousness. It's just obvious. The highest teachings I work with are the or the clearest for me at a certain point, for about six years I've been using them, are a little booklet called The Third Chinese Patriarch of Zen by Sin Sing Ming, called the Sin Sin Ming, rather, the Heart Mind Sutra. It's only about four pages long. 
but you could spend at least the next year on the first line. I'll give you the first line. The great way is not difficult for those who have no preferences. You ready for the second line, or would you like to work on that one for a while? <laughs> I'll just give you foreshadowing of what's to come. When love and hate are both absent, everything becomes clear and undisguised. But make the smallest distinction, and heaven and earth are set infinitely apart. Do you want to become free, or do you just want to feel good? Both ways. You and I are going for broke, whether you like it or not. First you think, well, there's a lot of work to do to get liberated. Then you're going to figure out there's a lot of work to do to not get liberated. Because it's going to pull you and push you. Once the hook is in, baby, you've been had. <laughs> there is no escape. You can try as you can to forget, but you'll keep remembering. You wouldn't be in this room except by some strange error unless you took birth just to bless us. I mean, you're here just why I'm here. You can call it light, you can call it love, you can call it awakening, you can call it God, you can call it liberating spirit. There is no name. You can transcend your separateness in order to know the uniqueness and delight in the uniqueness of your separateness. At first your faith flickers. You touch who you really are and you suddenly see that who you thought you were is just who you thought you were. And that you are. Just like the song we've been singing, I am. You are. You're not good, you're not bad, you just are. You are and it all is. Ah, and then you forget. You go back into your separateness and into your fear. And the fear seems so dark you think you're never going to find the light again. It's just a memory. It's like an old moldering butterfly in your collection. You might have gotten high the first time any number of ways. Falling in your head, motorcycling, cooking a bouillabaisse, knitting an afghan, having sex, who knows, taking drugs, whatever way you did it. You broke out of the prison of your own mind and you experienced your innocence. You experienced the Tao, the flow, the way of things, the Torah, the law. The body of Christ made manifest. You experienced it. You knew it. You grokked it. You were one with it. And then you forget it back into your separateness and you think you've lost it. And then you're busy being somebody who's lost it. And you're looking for it. <laughs> See? And you're looking for the spirit. You're seeking the spirit. And there are good seekers and there'll be seekers for 10,000 lives. It's like a myth. Who are you? I'm a seeker. Why aren't you a finder? Because I'm a seeker. Okay. So I was working with this woman, who, or we were working in our dying project. Stephen Levine and I were working with this woman, this one young lawyer who was dying of a brain tumor. And she had been doing the Jesus prayer for two years. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy upon me, a uh, miserable sinner. And then about three days before she died, she stopped doing it. And um, she just said that she was too much part of it all to do that anymore. That was too separating. She couldn't hold on to that duality anymore. I was just at a place in New Mexico with a, the wife of an old American Indian chief. 
And we were all singing Hare Krishna, but she kept singing Hare Jesus. I said, why don't you sing Hare Krishna? She says, because I hold on to the hem of Jesus' cloak. I said, well, why don't you become Jesus instead of holding on to his cloak? Why don't you transcend the dualism of the I-Thou, even, in order to enjoy the dance of it? Acknowledge who you are. You wake up a second time and a third time, and then 10,000 times you awake and you fall asleep and you awake and you fall asleep, until pretty soon your faith gets stronger. You know, even though you fall asleep, you're going to awake again. Even when it's all of it's hitting the fan. Even when it's, yuck. Can you imagine having a marriage where at the worst, yickiest time, you can look at your partner and say, are you here? I'm here. I hate your guts. <laughs> Isn't this horrible? Yuck. God, I wish we weren't here. Are you here? Yeah, I'm here. Pretty heavy, isn't it? Yeah. Well, somebody's got to play Lady Macbeth. Okay. okay. You may not even be able to laugh about it, but you can recognize. You can share the point of awareness that allows the two to live out their humanity because of that shared awareness. So after a long time, for maybe thousands of incarnations, you awake every now and then. For long, thousands of incarnations, each time you awake, you make believe you didn't. That's how far out it gets. It's like once I went to visit my mother when she was dying, and she was under morphine in the hospital, and I was under mescaline. And we met in a <laughs> space in which there was no mother and son, is all I can say. And we considered death and life and stuff. And the next day she said to me, we talked disgracefully. They had me under drugs. I mean, that was the highest we'd ever been together. <laughs> but her role was so real that time around. It was interesting. Later my guru said to me, you know, your mother is a very high being. And I said, didn't he mean she was a very high being? He said, no, she is a very high being. And suddenly there was a whole flip and I saw her soul and my soul and I saw us playing out middle-class mother-child dance, almost without a, an error, except under mescaline and morphine. I live so many threads dangling now. It's a beautiful line by Ram Tirth, uh, Swami Ram Tirth. This is just, he was, he walked into the, a river when he was about, I don't know, in his young youth, I think 20s or 30s, early 30s, I guess. He wrote this one poem that I remember. He's, he's written a number of things. Just feel what it feels like. I am without form. Try it on inside yourself. Feel what it feels like. I am without form, without limit. I am beyond space, beyond time. I am in everything. Everything is in me. I am the bliss of the universe. Everywhere I am. I am Sat Chit 
ananda. Absolute existence, absolute knowledge, absolute bliss. Tatvam asi, I am that. What does it feel like to expand beyond space, beyond time? To be in everything, to have everything in you. Certainly such a being isn't who you thought you were. Because such a being is unthinkable. It includes thought itself. I am without form, without limit. As such, your awareness, which is all there is, all there is, is the creative spark itself. You are creativity. You are love. I say we are in love, it's not necessarily a verb, I love you. It's I and you are in love. We are in love. We are sharing the space of love, which means that we are in union, in yoga. There is only one of us. And in order for there to be one of us, we have to step outside of our separateness. But we can't push our separateness away. We have to embrace it because it's part of the one. So experience simultaneously, stretch a little bit and experience simultaneously being without form, without limit, and at the same moment being uniquely you as a separate entity. See your separateness from your totality, which includes your separateness, but yet experience your separateness fully. Can you see that it is the trap of the dualistic mind that thinks you must be separate or one? while actually we are both separate and one. That part of us which is one is the creator, creator. That part of us which is separate is the created. You are living out a storyline as that which is created. You created that storyline. Can you allow for both of them at the same moment? You're going to have to stretch. You're going to have to stretch to appreciate that you both have free will and you are determined. 
your body and your thinking mind are all lawfully unfolding. All the laws of psychology and physics, and they all work. And at the same moment, who you are is free. Was, is, and will be. The only question is whether you identify with that which is created or with that which creates. And the final answer is you identify with neither of them, but deny neither of them. There is literally nowhere to stand in the game of liberation. Because if you were standing anywhere, you'd be afraid. There's no way to stand. It's like jumping out of an airplane. You have no parachute, but there's no earth. You're just going to be in free fall all the way. No form, no limit. And yet here we are in form. Milton said it this morning, he said that the, the way the system changes is because of each individual. The basic unit, the basic social institution that is the only institution to which you owe ultimate, ultimate, ultimate love and trust and obedience. is the truth of your own intuitive, deepest self. It's the institution of the individual human heart. That's the one. All the rest of the institutions come and go. I don't mean the physical heart, and I don't even mean the emotional heart. I mean the sin sing ming, the heart mind, the intuitive heart, the higher heart, the spiritual self, the I, the pure awareness, the Buddha mind, the Christ consciousness, the Christ love, that, that one. When you are true to that one, then you are no longer identifying with all of the separateness around it. And as Mahatma Gandhi said, when you turn yourself into zero, your power becomes unbeatable. It's the same line as Christ saying, had ye but faith, ye could move mountains. Because if you had enough faith, you would merge with that which you have faith in. And you would be the creative power of the universe. There isn't even a question in my mind that love, that isness, that pure awareness is a far greater power than any worldly power. And that it can be manifest in one human heart. When any one of us will live in enough truth and enough love and enough clarity and enough surrender, it takes just one. You think neutron bombs or anything? Don't be silly. This podcast is brought to you by the Love Serve Remember Foundation and Ramdas.org. We appreciate you listening and we appreciate all the support that you've given us. Please continue that support and donate at Ramdas.org. We can then continue to share what Ramdas has been sharing for all of these years.
Thank you.